Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Mass Bio Life Science Cares nonprofit pitch event. Uh, we are super excited to have you here today of all days to celebrate the nonprofits in Massachusetts. Um, I would like to tell you that every year when we've done this, I'd like to look at the competitors and see if there are any themes. And it is clear that this year's theme is community building. And I can think of nothing more important this November 4th, 2020, than community building. So I am delighted to be listening to these five organizations pitch their new nonprofits. Um, I wanna do a few shout outs before we start. Um, big shout out to Milka Kostik from the nonprofit uh, Mass Bio Forum, who was the lead on organizing this event for the forum, along with Lori Ryan and Sluter on our committee, as well as um, Chris Lindgren, who did a lot of the prep work on this event um, while she was at Mass Bio. Aptly work taken over by Jenny Nason and James Robe at Mass Bio. We're really grateful to them for their support and all of the logistical organization that it takes to do this. So a big thank you to them and the tech crew as well. Um, so before this event, all of our pitch competitors had time to work with coaches. I wanna thank them as well. Um, Sarah Cardozo Duncan, um, career coach and, and executive coach. Um, Mark Cote from um, an executive consultant, founder of Focal Point Coaching. Um, Eric, Pertens, per Eric Perkins, who is an ad genie with me, a veteran and director of our product team. Um, and also um, Jonathan Spack, who was longtime CEO of Third Sector New England and now is a nonprofit consultant. And um, a shout out to all of them for giving their time to help make the pitches excellent. Now I will introduce our judges. They will be doing the questioning of the presenters. Um, Laura Kleiman, last year's winner, um, founder of um, Reboot RX, and um, a very had a fantastic pitch at our last event. Sarah McDonald, executive director of Life Science Cares, who's probably known to most of you, um, and Katie McCarthy, who is the chief development officer at Halloran Consulting and knows a thing or two about business models. So um, we're super excited to have them here judging the pitch today. Um, the way this will work is each organization has five minutes to pitch or less, and then the judges have a few minutes to ask questions. We'll keep things moving along pretty quickly. Um, and then there'll be a break for about 10, 15 minutes for the judges to um, do the judging, and then we will come back and announce the winners. So stick with us to the end because that'll be the fun part. Um, I just wanna say before we start that all of these organizations are winners. I know that everybody says that, but the founders of these organizations have put their hearts and souls into doing a very hard thing to be impactful for society. And today is a great day to recognize their hard work. So I wanna thank them for their time on the pitch, but also for their time in doing the fantastic work that they do. So I would first like to introduce representative from Build Boston. Please introduce yourself and your first. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kenny Roberts. I am the program director at Build Boston. I have been with Build now for five years and I'm excited for this opportunity. So thank you all again. I'm trying to share my screen. All right, so as I begin, I would like to first uh, to the judges just ask you all a very simple question. What makes you come alive? What is that thing that excites you, motivates you, uh, gets you up every morning to tackle the day-to-day -day responsibilities that you have? For many of us, it may be just having the opportunity to align our careers with our passions, uh, to be able to uh, go forward and try to change the world one day at a time. For others of us right now, currently navigating this COVID-19 pandemic, it may be having the opportunity to just grab hold to some form of normalcy, whether it's some virtual activity or something that takes our mind off of the day-to-day -day grind and navigating this new normal we find ourselves in. Unfortunately, we find that a lot of people uh, now navigating this pandemic and communities of color specifically have the, unfortunate, uh, have the unfortunate situation of having to deal with this pandemic and just trying to survive. Uh, they find themselves in a modern day economy that isn't aligned when we look at the measurements and metrics of success um, that includes them in that. Um, we are at a pivotal moment in our nation's history when we find that too many are being left behind in this modern day economy. Uh, large wealth gaps are being extended uh, and we find that it's less and less opportunity for upward mobility. 
And we at Build are excited that and working with young people and using the vehicle of entrepreneurship that we can be uh, change agents in the racial equity issues that we find ourselves in today. Bill's mission is to use entrepreneurship to ignite the potential of young people in under-resourced communities and equip them for high school, college, and career success. We were founded in 1999 as a dropout prevention program. And today we currently serve upwards to 2000 students annually in New York City, East Palo Alto, California, Oakland, California, Washington, DC, and right here in Boston, Massachusetts. Today is a day better than any day before to actually introduce entrepreneurship education to our students. We can do this by two ways. We can first in, instill in them the entrepreneurial mindset where our students can become more, instill, more ingrained in self-agency. They can be able to adapt to the, the problems and situations we find ourselves in today. They also can develop the entrepreneurial school, skill set, which gives them the tools they need to build up social capital, learn financial literacy, and become a part of the 20 central skills that they need to be successful in whatever career path they choose. These 21st century skills are what we call our SPART skills. They are collaboration, communication, problem solving, innovation, grit, self-management. And we find that these students who have these skills uh, can not only see themselves as viable candidates for employment, but can work their way up in these, co these corporations and organizations to have a seat at the table as leaders to provide impact for the communities in which they live. In our program, we start off in the ninth grade. Our students launch successful small businesses they being assisted and facilitated with our dedicated build teacher, find themselves in a classroom with five or six of their peers on a team with the support and assistance of two dedicated professional mentors who come in and help them launch the business. They move on in year two where they're able to expand the business. They have the opportunity to either have mergers and acquisitions with their fellow peers and share success stories and, and how to navigate the entrepreneurial landscape. Years three and four, our juniors and seniors make an intentional pivot towards college and career access. They introduce the internships, college application process uh, so they can see themselves in their future um, developing a solid post-secondary education plan. Here at Build Our Impact, we are very, very excited and happy to see that when it comes to high school graduation rates, 96% of Build seniors on a national level graduate from high school on time, far surpassing the 53% national average we see from Black and Latinx youth. We're specifically excited here in Boston that we see that number at 97%. We also see in our college enrollment and completion rates that here in Boston, 94% of our built seniors enroll in college successfully, far surpassing the 67 enrollment rate we see amongst their peers. So this effective opportunity in entrepreneurship and introducing it to, to them directly gets their mindset on college or whatever their career path will be when they're in the ninth grade as opposed to waiting to junior year, as we see with common students in the high school landscape. Focusing on identity and community, entrepreneurship allows us to take a direct impact on racial equity by exposing our students to what it looks like to be true job creators, what it looks like to take their business idea from concept to customer. How do they see the real world problems they see every day and be able to tackle that in a classroom that we see commonly in our high schools. Local investment and national impact allow our corporate sponsors to help us be innovative and, and produce high quality programming for our students. We've been able to navigate COVID-19 by introducing a virtual design challenge, where we've taken our existing curriculum and put it on a fully remote virtual platform. How can you help? You can assist us with mentoring. We have 60 to 90 minute dedicated mentors who serve once a week with our students. You also can help us with philanthropic investment and becoming part of our advisory board engagement. Bill uniquely sits in the intersection of innovation, education, and community. And we'd be excited for you to assist us in that. As I said before, I started with what makes you come alive? I implore us to not ask the question, what does the world need? I implore us to ask our young people what makes them come alive? Because ultimately what the world needs today is for our young people to come alive. Thank you so much for your time. Do you have any questions? Thanks so much, Kenny. That was fantastic. Um, now to the judges, what questions can do you guys have? Hi, Kenny, this is Katie McCarthy. I was wondering how you engage with the students. Do you work in specific schools or is there a different form of outreach for you to be connecting with the students? Thank you, Katie, for your question. Yes, we start off with our schools. We're in six schools in the Boston public school system. Uh, we're in the Dorchester area, Rochester, Mattapan, Charlestown as well. And what we find with our students, we start off in the ninth grade actually pitching built to them um, as an elective course. So they sign up. Um, instead of signing up for traditional art or physical, physical education classes, they decide to take entrepreneurship with, here with us as built. And it's a credit bearing class that they get credit for on their transcripts. 
Kenny, as a follow up on that, um, obviously school looks different for those BPS students right now. Um, around the question of sustainability, how does Build think about providing your programs in a non um, in person environment? Great question, Sarah. So right now, as, as I stated, we ha we're able to pivot to a virtual uh, remote platform for our students, leveraging our community, what we call our virtual design challenge where we took them starting a business, either developing a, a social campaign, actually developing a, a specific business idea on a fully um, online platform. Um, we wanna extend that by able introducing digital badging for our juniors and seniors, so they can have skill-based learning and be able to apply um, those learnings to making them more viable candidates for internships and full-time full, full -time employment as they go into college. And we also are looking at developing our alumni network so that as students are in there college years and matriculated through college, they have access to a more robust network with our corporate partners. Thank you. Great job, Kenny. Um, I had the same question, Sarah and Katie, so thank you for <laughs> asking those. Um, so I'll stick with a question about um, how you are generating your revenue. Do you have any earned revenue or schools paying you to provide this some type of programming? Yeah, great question, Laura. So our school partners do uh, participate in, in having a, 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 an agreement with us uh, for the ninth and 10th grade classes that we provide for them in school, uh, five days a week classes. We also have our satellite partnerships where we have schools who are in more suburban areas who have access to our curriculum. Um, we do trainings for teachers on site um, where we might not have built staff doing direct service with the students. We do assist the teachers with weekly check-ins and being able to support them with training. And those school districts will be able to opt in um, by providing some type of financial um, by opting in financially. So to be clear, you're not generating the earned revenue yet, but you're working towards a plan for doing so? Yes, yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the judges? Okay, great. Kenny, thank you so much. Good luck and we'll see you thank later. You. Thank you. Um, now I would like to welcome um, Molly and Naja from New England Graduate Women in Science and Engineering. We're going in alphabetical order here. Um, and they will take uh, be presenting the next pitch. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. And Naja, would you like to introduce us? Absolutely. Uh, well, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to speak with you all today about New England graduate women in science and engineering. Uh, my name is Naja Walton, and I'm co-presenting today with uh, Molly Bird. Uh, we are both directors for New England Graduate Women in Science and Engineering, and I apologize in advance if you hear the street traffic. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, um, as a first-generation college student, I cannot emphasize enough the value of having a supportive and inclusive community for healthy professional as well as personal development. Both Molly and I developed our passion for science at a young age, Yet the further into our education we've gone, we, like many other women in STEM, have encountered the inequity and representation of women in STEM, which is often manifest as us being the only one or one of few women in our respective departments or programs. And next slide, please. While women and men, oh, sorry. Um, it's very important to address the numbers that represent the current problem we're combating. Firstly, there's a very high attrition rate for women in STEM. Here in purple represents the number of women compared to the number of men in the United States that achieve primary as well as secondary education. While women and men complete both high school and even secondary education at a similar rate, when we begin to look at the amount of women earning STEM bachelor's degrees, the rate is nearly half that of men. This has downstream consequences in the number of women in STEM occupations. And here we see that across all STEM fields, women comprise less than 50% of these positions with women in engineering, which is the field of Molly is in, comprising only 13% of the engineering workforce. This disparity is seen even more drastically when we look at the representation of marginalized communities, where here in purple, we see the percentage of representation of these communities in the residential population. And in blue, we see the percentage of these populations in the STEM workforce. Notably, underrepresented minorities, particularly Black and Hispanic individuals in STEM occupations, is even lower than the representation of women in STEM and is not on par with representation of these communities in the greater residential population of the United States. And so the mission of New England GYs is to break down barriers that lead to educational isolation for women in STEM 
by building a community that supports, celebrates, and advocates for equity in graduate STEM education for women and gender minorities. We are a collective of graduate students across eight universities in the New England area, which alone accounts for upwards of 15,000 graduate women in STEM. And New England GYs is addressing these persistent issues through three tiers. Firstly, through community building between graduate students and leaders in STEM education. Secondly, we use education and advocacy to further institutional knowledge and advocate by creating an information repository that promotes equitable graduate education. And lastly, we're able to provide inclusive professional development programming that is centered on creating the next leaders in STEM. And I'll now turn it over to Molly to tell you about the achievements we've been making in these areas. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, thanks, Nadja. We've already had many achievements in these areas so far, so I'll just give an example of each. For community building, using the information we gathered from the other GYs groups, we helped Tufts form their own GYs, or Graduate Women in Science and Engineering group, and they're still going strong three years later. Under education and advocacy, we've collected data on student knowledge of Title IX policies and initiated dialogues between GYs groups and their respective Title IX offices. Finally, being part of our executive team empowers graduate women to develop their leadership skills and to gain nonprofit experience. Our focus for the past few years has been to determine our niche, perfect what we already do, establish standard operating practices, and develop an effective recruitment strategy to help ensure the sustainability of any GYs. Each year, we continue to evolve to improve how we function and to maximize our impact. And now that we've built a strong foundation in the eight schools, we're looking to expand our collective and our impact by adding new schools as well as industry and community partnerships. Our next step is to expand um, further into New England, more than doubling our representation. And then we plan to expand across the US, representing more than 250,000 graduate women in STEM. Um, our organization has the potential to even go international, representing more than 1 million graduate women, as the climate problem in STEM is practically ubiquitous. During the current global pandemic, it's more important now than ever to build a community to combat the isolation that's pervasive in STEM for women. The new virtual state of the world makes it easier to connect with distant schools and to grow our organization to disseminate the information in our repository globally. The access, visibility, and partnerships we would gain by winning this challenge would be a crucial step in helping us grow our organization to make our dream of a welcoming, inclusive, equitable environment in STEM fields a reality. If this dream resonates with you, we ask that you seriously consider us for this award. And I'd like to end um, by thanking all the people who made this possible, including our pitch coach, Sarah, um, our advisory board, the schools, and of course, our incredible team of graduate women. Thank you all for listening, and we're happy to take any questions. Great, thank you guys. Questions from the judges? So that was great, thank you. Um, just curious, as you grow in scale to that 1 million women in STEM um, you know, milestone, where do you see your biggest challenges to kind of keep up with that growth? So I think something that we've noticed um, and the, part of the reason why for the last couple of years we focused on staying with eight schools is that um, originally we were trying to do meetings in person. Um, obviously meetings in person help build those relationships better between the schools. And that's obviously not easily scalable. Um, but now that everybody's pretty focused on being virtual, we found that it's a lot easier to coordinate these meetings um, and so, of course, there's no difference between connecting with Brown over Zoom and connecting with Stanford over Zoom. So the more virtual focus is at least helping us expand that way. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So it, it occurs to me that one of your greatest strengths, the fact that you are a student-led consortium, also has the potential to be a challenge in that students and graduate students are going to cycle sort of in and out of this phase of life. How have you thought about ensuring kind of continuity and succession and long-term sustainability for the organization? 
Yeah, so for us, uh, we've tried to recruit early in the graduate process. Uh, myself, I'm actually a, a second year uh, PhD student while Molly is in her fifth year. Um, <laughs> so we have that continuity where we're able to train younger graduate students so that when they are in uh, say Molly's position, that they're able to then do the same for the next generation of graduate women. Yes. And yes, that is an important thing that we have noticed is that obviously as graduate women in the schools, we know what's going on. We know what actually works, what doesn't work. Um, and we can actually speak to the school administrators, but yes, given that there is the cycling, um, I think more in the future, we're thinking of maybe having consistent board of directors who might be more alumni. Um, and then the people who are actually doing the day-to-day -day stuff would continue to be graduate students. So that's something we're considering. Thank you. So maybe can you talk a little bit about what success looks like for you in terms of the impact of your work on women in STEM? Do you wanna take this one, Naja? Or sure. Um, there, there are a number of ways that uh, success manifests uh, in graduate school, especially. Uh, but through our through our nonprofit work, um, success to to me is having that community where uh, a woman who is in her graduate department, who may be the only one, comes to us and is able to advocate for things that she sees going on in her department that she feels is inequitable. Um, I know that's been the case for, for a number of women. Um, and on a larger scale, being able to connect with community partners and seeing our, our mentorship and advisory board grow um, truly speaks to, to the, the influence that we're able to have and the impact that we're actually able to make at both the community as well as uh, the graduate school level. So would you say that your goal is to um, empower uh, women in these fields to speak up and to pursue careers um, continuing on through through the climbing up the ladder? So more women in um, say PI uh, faculty positions, would that be a goal? Absolutely, yeah. So we showed some uh, very uh, disheartening numbers, but the one of the goals is to retain women in their STEM fields because we are going through graduate school. We are training to, to really uh, make breakthroughs in our fields. Um, it's unfortunate that many are, are dropping out of the so-called uh, pipeline, uh, but we're looking to completely reinvent this pipeline and create a space where it's normal to have women on your board. It's normal to have women as a, a woman as a PI. It's normal to have a minority woman as a PI or a director um, at a biotech company. And just to add a little bit onto what Nash was alluding to, um, with the pipeline, so by having community, academic, industry partnerships, um, we'll, have a, we'll create our own pipeline, basically because we'll know where the industry jobs are in STEM, we'll know where the academic jobs are in STEM, we'll have the graduate women who are talented and ready to do it, and maybe they just need that connection. So also serving as that connection. Great, thank you guys very much. That was great. Good Thanks you. guys. Thank you. thank you so much. Our next presenter uh, organization will be our Odyssey. I'm waiting for, uh, for tech here. Ah, there we go. Hi, Seth. Seth hello, Robert. Hello from our Odyssey will now be presenting as the next competitor. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen and then we're, we'll be ready to go. So, and we're good, awesome. So did you know that there are over 10 million young adults between the ages of 18 to 35 who are impacted by a rare chronic condition? And I happen to be one of those young adults. Before I dive deeper into our odyssey, I'm gonna share a little bit about my own personal story. So at the age of 15, I learned that my mom had this rare neurological genetic disease known as Huntington's disease, which slowly deteriorates a person's physical and cognitive abilities over 10 to 20 years. And because it's genetic, I had a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. And five years later at the age of 20, decided to go through testing 
and found out that I tested positive for it and will end up like my mom one day unless there's an effective treatment or cure. And when learning about this, I felt alone in my health journey. It was tough to really connect with others who understood what I was going through. And although I had a great support system of friends and family, none of them understood what it was like to be a young person impacted by a health condition. But years later, I was able to find my community and connect with young adults who just simply understood what I was going through. And it was like I, I had a weight that lifted off my shoulders and I could just be myself again. It was during these conversations where I learned that there wasn't enough year round support for young adults uh, living with a, health, with a rare chronic condition. And I realized that the main focus a lot for young people was on transitional care, but it never looked, we never looked at the holistic picture of what it means to transition in different parts of your life. And so we decided to do something. And last June, we started our Odyssey uh, with a mission to, of connecting young adults impacted by a rare chronic condition with social emotional support in the hope of improving their quality of life and a vision of establishing a national organization with a platform that empowers, educates, connects, and connects young adults experiencing health challenges. How we get there is through our four main programs, in-person meetups, which all happened prior to COVID, our virtual meetups, our topic-specific meetups addressing the unmet needs of young, young adults, including family planning, navigating college or career, dating, how to talk to friends and family, the list goes on, and our Odyssey Spotlight, which is an opportunity to amplify the young adult voice through our monthly blog, podcast, or speaking opportunities. Now we call them meetups because the term support group is a little bit too formal for us. And we like to provide a place where we're talking and connecting with one another beyond just the health condition. And so a little bit about stats about our odyssey since our inception in, in June of 2019. Uh, we've done quite a lot of work in the community. We hosted seven in-person meetups. Again, all prior to COVID, they were in Boston, Philly, and DC. We hosted 34 virtual meetups all this year, uh, three topic specific meetups, and with a reach of over 2,900 people from 35 different states, six different countries, and young adults who are impacted by over 120 different rare and chronic conditions. And where we wanna go. So we've, got, we've done quite a lot, but we have some ambitious goals for the next 12 to 24 months. We wanna continue to increase the number of in-person and virtual meetups by about 25%, but also extend our reach. So it's not just the reach of how many people we, we connect with, but also the young adults from different rare and chronic conditions. We want to develop dedicated resources around the unmet needs of young adults. As mentioned before, there's, they're very different than children and older adults. And we wanna make sure that they have resources that they can turn to when looking for uh, support or services. And then we wanna train young adults to be able to lead their own virtual and in-person meetups and really feel a part of a community. I wanted to share this quote with, with all of you. So this was from a, a fellow young adult. This group has really opened my eyes in realizing that I'm not alone, but most importantly, that I don't have to be alone in this journey. So with, with a membership to Mass Bio, we feel like it will give us a chance to spread awareness about who we are, while we can also connect and build relationships with other nonprofits and corporate members in the health space who focus on uh, serv servicing young adults. The funding will help us kind of build those friendships and invite those young adults to the party. But more importantly, it will help us provide a place for them to get their voice heard and support their unmet needs by meeting them where they are in their journey. The way that we really measure our success is through our, our uh, post meetup survey and it's been great to see that young, young people are, are continuing to, you know, want to learn more, want to be engaged, and really want to get involved in, in their own community. So we ask you to support the leaders of tomorrow, who are the ones making a difference in the health community. Thank you so much, Seth. Okay. Judges, he's all yours. Thanks, Seth. That was great. Um, question, I, and you may have mentioned this, and I'm sorry if I missed it. 
Um, are all of the meetings um, facilitated and are the discussions led purely by the other members or do you bring in outside speakers, physicians, nurses, patient advocacy groups, et cetera? So one, one great question. One of the biggest things we wanted to do is make it for young people by young people. And so we lead most of them uh, as, as a co-founder and board president. I am a full-time volunteer. We have actually one part-time staff member who helps out and she's a fellow young adult. Who, so we help lead, lead those. But for our topic specific meetups, as of now, it's young adults sharing their own experience. So talking about navigating college or career, how to live positively, what it means to participate in clinical trials. And so that's kind of where our framework is because people feel like they can really connect and dive deeper into those conversations uh, with other young adults. Okay, that's great, thanks. No problem. Uh, I'm interested to hear a little bit about what you think the, the business model of the nonprofit is. How, how do you see funding being structured for the growth that you're envisioning? So as of now, uh, we're currently funded through individual contributions, corporate sponsors, and foundational grants. And we, want, we know it's important to diversify our funding. Uh, we've been very fortunate, again, to, to have you know, people who believe in our mission. And we want to continue to do that by not just those individual contributions, but being able to reach out to you know, grant, uh, grant makers as well as uh, corporate sponsors that are focusing in on young people. So it's looking at what foundations or what companies are working in this space and how can we build partnerships to continue that, that model up. But it's, they help us really fund the service of providing you know, that programming piece of it. Thank you. No problem. Great job. I think I'll pick up on that topic a little bit. Um, so what I'm thinking about is, is there any way to, um, would it make sense to narrow the focus or have kind of subdivisions based on rare, the actual conditions or diseases? I know they're very rare, so maybe there's some like high level grouping that would make sense. But with some more of a focus, it might be easier, for example, to partner with pharmaceutical companies who are working in that disease area and um, perhaps generate some revenue there, but also some interesting partnerships. Related to that, I was thinking, you know, how are you finding the people who are participating right now? Is it currently word of mouth? Have you reached out to other rare disease organizations like NORD? Um, seems like that could be a great opportunity to connect with others. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to answer the first one real quick. And then the, and the second one, the, the first one, um, when it comes to that kind of focus area, we have thought about it. We actually, I've, I've worked with and are, are looking to partner with more patient advocacy organizations because we know that they can only do so much. And so we wanna help be that helping hand to provide that support for young people in their community. Uh, we also are hoping to train young adults who can then hold it within their community. But what's interesting is, you know, prior to starting, I put, I put together my own survey and found that about 85% of young people are comfortable connecting with people outside their disease state. And so it shows that even though that they would love to connect with people who have that same condition, they also are comfortable talking with people beyond that because of the similarities. Um, regarding partnerships, we actually are a NORD member uh, as well as part of the Global Genes Foundation Alliance. So they've been a great help in, uh, in helping us spread the word, social media, and then just the young adults who attend our meetups. Honestly, they've been the, the vocal point of like just spreading the word and, and helping us uh, let others know about it. So that's been a huge help and just trying to stay on top with all the social media channels as well. Tim, for, tip for your next pitch, you might want to mention some of those partnerships. I'm glad that this came up um, during the Q&A. Yep. Great question. Thank Seth, thank you so much. Um, and we're going to shift to the next pitch now. Thank you. Uh, next up, thank you. Next up in alphabetical order is um, Science Rehashed. And um, you guys take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Mehdi Jurfi. 
and I'm thrilled and we are delighted to be part of this amazing event and with an incredible uh, teams uh, for this competition. Uh, I'm the co-founder and co-host of Science Rehash. I'm also a faculty member in the neurology department at MGH uh, and Harvard Medical School. And today I'm joined by Shen Ning, a co-founder and co-host of Science Rehash. Shen, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mehdi. Hi, everyone. We're really thrilled and humbled today to share our mission with you all today. We're a team of scientists motivated by providing universal access to recently published science to scientists around the world. Imagine wanting to be a scientist while growing up in the Middle East in a lower middle class family raised by a single mother alongside three siblings. This was Mehdi's upbringing and being a scientist was Mehdi's childhood dream. As he pursued his education in Iran, he discovered the limitations and the lack of resources. During his modern nanochemistry course, he found that the most recent papers available at his university was buried in the backs of the stacks in the library from over 10 years ago. Years later, and many gray hairs later, after overcoming many setbacks, he pursued his graduate education in Switzerland and then his, his postdoctoral training at MIT and Harvard. And it was during this time that he could finally freely explore the latest science and engineering breakthroughs without any limitations. And because of this, he wanted to give back by eliminating access disparities and help future young scientists around the world to overcome the hurdle he experienced. We believe in open access. And as of today, there are over 2 million scientists in the developing countries without the same resources as we do here in Boston due to the lack of subscription to scientific journals at their institution. Even though open access has come a long way, it's still very expensive to publish these journals. Therefore, many high impact articles are still published in subscription based journals. Unfortunately, we cannot share these articles openly, but we can ask the authors of these papers to talk about their work. Therefore, at our mission at Science Rehashed is to provide universal access to some of these papers through podcast interviews with the lead authors to highlight the motivation of the study, the key findings, and future applications. And to do this, we brought together 13 very talented individuals to form an interdisciplinary team ranging from the faculty members at MGH to graduate students to freelance artists to audio engineers. Podcasting is an accessible uh, platform for everyone with internet, but we do recognize that there's a number of competitors in the current science podcast landscape. However, we are unique in that we have episodes covering topics accessible to the general public, episodes going in depth about the science, and episodes covering professional development topics. We have four different series, and we expanded this so over the last year, that fill in the gaps with the current science podcast landscape. Rehashing Science covers recently published high impact papers. Our Meet the Legend series interviews top pioneers in the life sciences and engineering. Our 360 Perspective series provides a very broad and comprehensive view of the topic, serving as a platform to disperse diverse, but also accurate information, such as about COVID-19. Our Wonder Women in Science and Engineering series highlights female scientists to promote their work and to discuss issues regarding the gender disparity issue in the STEM fields. In a nutshell, Science Rehash is a podcast designed to be from a very interdisciplinary and culturally diverse scientist team to cover a more comprehensive dialogue in science. And since October 2019, we've released 21 episodes hosted 32 leading experts in the fields of medicine, biological sciences, and engineering, and released over 500 minutes of scientific content. We also have reached people from over 75 different countries across the globe. And now we're seeing a rising number of listeners across all podcast platforms. And to continue our spread of our mission across the US and internationally, we recently initiated an ambassador program where scientists and students from all over the globe can introduce science rehash to their peers through the platforms specific to their countries. However, we believe that numbers are not the only measure for our success. Our success is really dictated by the listeners and the value they get from the discoveries made accessible by science rehashed. The support we've received so far from the community has been really incredible and humbling, and we're featured in a number of different news articles and selected as one of the top podcasts in the life sciences category on Apple Podcast. 
And in the upcoming years, we aim to achieve a more pronounced international presence and expand our community outreach. We're also initiating other media platforms, including YouTube and a monthly newsletter. As a part of our growth strategy, we'll continue to focus on growing our listener base until the latter half of next year, and we'll continue to apply for grant funding. Meanwhile, we're networking and partnering with different companies, and we're seeking sponsorships from biotech companies, VCs, and other entities that share our mission or would like to support our mission. Our goal is to make sure that no aspiring individual will have to give up on science because of the lack of resources because this should be the last challenge any scientist has to face in their arduous journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions from the judges? Thank you so much, that was great. So I guess a couple of questions, I'll just start with um, a, a basic one. Um, you know, how do you decide on the topics, right? It seems like you, there are so many great places where you could take this to share, um, you know, science in communities that don't have the same level of access. You know, how and, and when do you decide, you know, really how to zero in on, on the topics for the different podcasts? I can take this, Jim. Yeah, so we have an amazing team of scientists. That's the, the, the one of the unique parts with science rehash, which is coming from scientists to scientists. So when we, we, we approach any breakthrough in science or any discoveries in life science and engineering, we have the, 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 the platform to pitch this uh, paper to the other scientists in the team. And we have a, a kind of a platform to discuss it and see how novel is it and the tra translational uh, discoveries. And then we decide if we're, gonna, if we're gonna cover this or not. And also we have a, we have a team of producers and writers all should be on board to, 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 to decide if this is the right uh, paper to, to pitch for the science I hashed. I see, okay. So it's a somewhat standardized um, selection criteria that you use? Absolutely, and in a long in a long term, the, the the plan is to have our own advisory board in a different fields, from life sciences to biotechnology to engineering. That we can we can we can we can consult with them. What 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 are the 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 the, the novel discoveries? What are the top notch science going on with with the specific field that we can cover? Because we are limited in the in the papers that we can release. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So um, I guess maybe then looking at the other side, not the kind of creation, but the, the distribution, uh, podcasts are really hot now. And I think all of us being home in front of all of this technology has made it super easy to make them. What's your marketing plan? How do you kind of shape and identify the folks who need to be listening to this and make sure they are? I can start this off. Thank you very much for this question. Um, so first we have a very active social media platform as well as uh, we use a, um, a online platform that disperses our um, episodes across all different platforms. So Podbean will go on Apple, it will go on Spotify, et cetera. And um, especially when it comes to international countries, we understand those countries have different uh, language, there's, you know, language barriers, there's also different platforms themselves. And this is where our ambassador program is really helpful. And that's why we're developing it because they are familiar with all the different platforms that are being used in their home country and how to distribute it properly. And so we're working with them um, in order to distribute it to the right people through the right platforms and if needed, translate our uh, episodes into their language. I don't know if, if Joanne has already gotten to you, but there's a great organization called Seeding Labs that works with scientists in many <laughs> countries that I would think would have, be a great distribution partner for you. <laughs> already get to them. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Thank you. I lost my connection for a second, but I think <laughs> you were done, right, Sarah? Okay, great. Um, and just so first to clarify, is your audience scientists or the layperson? 
it's I can take this. It, it's like most of our listeners are scientists for the, but it also depends on the series that we release. For example, mm -hmm. when we look into the 360 perspective series is, is we looking in the modality or disease or any type of uh, problems in science from a different perspective, from different lenses. So definitely general audience can listen to that and can understand it. But most of our listeners and our focus is for scientists. Got it. Okay, and then my real question is, um, have you approached the journals to help advertise these podcasts? Uh, absolutely. This is very funny because I'm in, in discussion with the Nature Editor. We are in discussion also with the Plus One for the Open Science. I'm in discussion also with a few other editors that we can we can advocate the, the, the mission. They can, they can help us to, to connect us with the right uh, partners, with the right uh, people to really, uh, really spread the word. Great, thank you guys very much. We're gonna move on. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, um, we have Fanuel Mundi from the STEM Advocacy Institute who will be pitching last. Take it away, Fanuel. Great, thank you, Joanne. Um, Humble to be here. Let me share my slides. All right, uh, my name is Fanyol Wendy and I'm the founder and chief executive officer of the STEM Advocacy Institute, in short, SAI. I'm humble to be here in, in amidst all the other wonderful organizations who have done a wonderful job of really pointing at this issue of uh, the STEM uh, education and STEM programming is facing around the world. And these issues can be seen from a level of trainees, whether it's about mental health, whether it's about inclusion, mentoring. And I can speak because that's my own experience, uh, having been a graduate student and postdoc beforehand. At the same time, on the other side are the trainers, okay, where the issues of access to funding, infrastructure, professional development, evaluation on the programming that they're developing to try to solve these issues. And around the world, there are a lot of people that are, have the expertise and they're excited about working on these issues. And you've heard from several of them today. Um, and this number is increasing as more graduate students, postdocs and others are coming into the field looking for that support to build um, uh, new creative solutions to, to, to tackle these, these issues. And SAI is a dedicated one-stop shop to incubate and launch those ideas. It providing infrastructure, training, mentorship, and the most importantly, funding to accelerate and enable the building of these new tools, programming that can expand pathways of access between STEM and society around the world. Because this is a global issue as we have seen from prior presenters. And so with such global issue and diverse challenges, you need a diverse coalition of people that are, are uh, working towards diverse solutions. And this is our team uh, of residents that have joined us uh, that are currently here. They are faculty members, they are postdocs, they are graduate students, undergrads. And also we have one high school student that recently joined us who had a very promising idea that he's working on with us. I don't have time to tell you about all their wonderful work, um, but I wanna tell you about one story and, and I hope this slide can uh, help you appreciate the diversity of the projects that they're solving. And earlier on in the story of SAI, we had Prasha Salwate Dutra who joined SAI uh, with a podcast uh, uh, platform that she was building, Her STEM Story. And or fast forward a hundred episodes or so later uh, over, over the, of the year period, she was able to then use that knowledge, talking with women about their stories in STEM in providing and building an entrepreneurship platform through her business, her STEM consulting, whereby she's now strategically helping women navigate careers in STEM and others. And now she has over 8,000 followers on Twitter and her podcast is uh, growing very rapidly. And she recently gave a TED talk um, and so that is an inspiring story at SAI. She's now one of our chief residents and instructor 
and is on our board of trustees. Um, and so we're very, very excited. Um, and with that knowledge, fast forward a couple of years later, we have now systematized that process. Okay, we now have this program called the SCI Fellows Program, where we bring in fellows, they spend uh, time with us 10 weeks, they are matched up with a mentor, they get funding, uh, they get weekly lectures, and example here at the bottom, these two slides, and whereby we discuss relevant um, um, uh, knowledge and, and issues regarding logic model building, funding, uh, to thinking about partnership, how do you form them, how do you maintain them, um, and so it's really exciting. In fact, we're having our demo day uh, on the 14th for our fourth cohort of, uh, uh, of fellows who mostly, most of them are graduate students and we also have a postdoc. In the past, we've had also a faculty member as well. How do we do this? Our model uh, using and leveraging the expertise that we're developing, we can uh, uh, host contracts. We just finished one with Brandeis University do events, uh, ticket sales, we had conferences before. Also, we have donations where individuals are excited about the programming, they wanna support the residents, they wanna support our programming. And also grants whereby we are uh, bringing in grants to do our internal programming and our residents are writing their own grants and we're helping them do that to run their programs and they're bringing them through SAI. And again, as I mentioned, since we have that infrastructure, we can provide that uh, foundation. And so these numbers here, the breakdown you're seeing is from our past fiscal year that we just completed. And it's working, okay? Just, we just finished our first quarter and the combined uh, revenue there um, is basically almost two and a half X of the combined revenue of the past four fiscal years. And this really is a, is a signal for us and we, have not, we couldn't have done it without the help of these wonderful organizations that believe and know that this model works. It's a unique model that allows us to bring together different people, um, different expertise, and, and together in one place to, to, to try to, to solve all the issues uh, in, in STEM. And so onward and upward, and I'm happy to take any of your questions about SAI. Thank you so much. Thanks, Fanuel. Uh, questions from the judges? Sure, thanks, Fanuel. Um, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more about what success looks like for SAI, both you know now and then also in the next three to five years. Does that definition of success sort of remain the same or do you see that evolving? I think for us is really building that expertise internally and continue to grow that. We, from our engagement with um, a students and other people that want to join, they're telling us we need more support. In fact, more and more and more support. And so for us right now, it's really about how do we expand that uh, repertoire milieu of expertise to enhance and build. Uh, and I can tell you one story. We have a fellow that is, uh, he was a fellow from Kenya and he presented us very unique challenges to work with uh, and thinking through how do we do that. So, how uh, for us, we're seeing that now expanding the uh, growth and that internal expertise. And then in the next three to five years, as we grow that uh, expertise, we can then expand on our business model. So we can engage other organizations, uh, train individuals. So it's really that cycle, that internal cycle that we're looking to accelerate and, and improve on. Thanks. So maybe apropos to uh, to why we're here today, but are, are you incubating for-profit businesses, nonprofit organizations, both? Does it not matter? How do you think about the sort of core audience? Yeah, so well, for our fellows program, so this is really the entry to becoming a resident. You kind of have to do this fellows program. It gives us a chance to work with you over 10 weeks. We get to see how you work. We really get into the nuts and bolts of your idea. Okay, and most of these people are applying uh, our graduate students. And so we've opened up before to broad sort of people, most of our graduate students, and they're coming to us uh, with really early stage ideas. Most of them haven't even been launched. So for us, it's a wonderful time where we get to really set the, uh, the foundation right. What is a logic model, for example, is the first thing. We spend a lot of time going over the logic models. And for us, that is where uh, if someone ends up taking that and creating a for-profit uh, ent ent enterprise, perfectly fine. Prasha Sawata did that. 
And so for us, the definition of success, again, is seeing these programs sustain, sustain right? Becoming fundable and, and lasting longer. Not that we create something and then it dies away. We want it to be there. And so for us, we're tracking how, you know, how long they stay, what follow-on funding do they get? Because they stay in touch with us. We do weekly, monthly meetings where every member uh, at least once a year presents updates. Uh, even alumni are welcome. So it's a really kind of fun atmosphere. And just a quick follow up. Uh, is anybody invited to participate in the, the upcoming demo day? Absolutely. Everyone's welcome. Awesome. Thanks. We'll, we'll uh, ask MassBio to follow up and share with folks the, the event link. Great. Great. Um, so to clarify, for this program is for anybody who has an idea about how to address any type of issue in STEM. Is that right? That's correct. These are graduate students and postdocs. It's a, we have over the years we have, we have found that this is the group and we pull people that really need the help. Great. And um, so my main question is, can you talk a little bit more about the contract model? Uh, so you mentioned uh, something you did recently with Brandeis. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so this is actually, we were subcontracted out for a grant. They were building a new platform there where they're looking to connect uh, science teachers and, and uh, faculty members in university. So they looked at our work. One of our projects that we were building, for example, is called the Journal of Stories in Science. I encourage you guys to check that out. It's super exciting. And uh, we had this growing um, ecosystem of followers. And so they wanted us our expertise in community building and thinking through how do we uh, connect uh, people. And so we, we were um, added as a um, line item, if you will, on an NSF grant. And so we see that as a model whereby we can, given our expertise, we can get engagement from whether university or a for-profit company that is looking to use our expertise. When we are currently talking with other universities as well who are saying, hey, could you help us on this grant if we were writing? Uh, to, to be this, to do this thing, because you guys can do that. Uh, or sometimes they say, well, you already have this thing that you're building. For example, the Journal of Stories in Science or uh, Nature Evolve. Uh, how can we add this to our grant? And so then we work with them to, to generate that. Oh, Joanne, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much. My space bar didn't work like it was supposed to there in this format. Um, uh, fun well, thank you very much. Okay, so the judges are going to retire from the event for a few minutes. We will be back by 4.15 for the award ceremony. Thank you, everybody.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, it was really, really hard to decide. So uh, that was the most rapid fire conversation I have ever seen. Um, so, um, wow, I just want to say congratulations to all the pitches. We were inspired. We were uh, excited about all of their success. Um, but there was one pitch that met really the best, all of the criteria of a pitch event, which is great pitch, great business model, great communication, um, clarity of mission, um, and um, really high marks on all of the category the most. And I would like to present this year's nonprofit pitch winner as Science Rehashed. Yay! <laughs> so hopefully uh, we will be joined by Mehdi and Chen. I am really humbled and thrilled <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting us, for giving us the opportunity and we're gonna make sure this prize will go a long way and gonna help thousands of scientists around the globe to passionate scientists to access science. And I'm on behalf of all Science Rehash team, again, thank you so much. So we, so we will, we will hold on, Shen, we will present the check. It's virtual, but... Exciting. There it is, the giant chat. <laughs> 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 I have to get a picture. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for Life Science Cares because uh, we couldn't do this without the support of the entire community that funds and provides these kinds of grants and awards from Life Science Cares. We and were so excited to participate and uh, to everybody who participated. Wow. Uh, just inspired and really excited to, to know you all. Yeah. Shen, did you want to say something? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just, I was very surprised and really happy because there were so many wonderful projects. And I really want to thank um, at Gene and Life Science Cares for this opportunity and uh, to both pitch and kind of share a mission. Um, and I'm really glad that it worked out. Thank you so much. This is a great, um, very humbling. Thank you. Great. Well, and we know that um, all the pitchers will um, be have a lot of success because of the passion that they bring to their work. So uh, we want to thank MassBio for recognizing the greater than 200 different companies in our uh, community, life science nonprofits in all different areas. So it's a huge area and part of our segment. And um, we are proud to be banding together in the full diversity of nonprofit work to recognize um, five finalists and one winner today. So thanks very much. Have a good night, everybody. And uh, look forward to seeing you more. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.